Hello, good morning. For developers, it's still good morning. It's not noon yet. And I'm very excited to be here. The last time I've been here at the Linux Days in Graz is actually more than 10 years ago. And I always find it very exciting, first of all, that this event still exists. And the other thing is that still people are coming here. The organizing committee creates an environment where people, developers, friends of open source, uh, friends of free software can actually share knowledge and insights. To start my presentation today, I actually want to share a, a, a short little story with you. So more or less recently, we registered our daughter at kindergarten preschool. And we had to fill out that little form in the beginning, right? And they said, oh, if your daughter is sick, make sure your daughter doesn't have a fever for at least 24 hours straight before she comes back to kindergarten, right? So the idea is that other kids don't get infected, other kids don't get a fever too, right? So I, as a security-minded person, what is the one thing that I would never ever do? I would never ever measure the temperature of my kid, right? And then what would they do? I would infect the other kids. So obviously this is uh, not something that a person would do, but it shows that uh, the kindergarten basically trusts me as a parent. And to start my presentation, actually, I want to show you that trust is a very bad word, all right? So we have to start thinking adversarially if we want to build secure systems. Uh, over the years, I've done so many security reviews for uh, other companies and the company I'm currently working at. And usually I start, okay, we, we look at a system and then I say, okay, so now what if I do X to your system? And then people say, oh, why, why would anyone do that? Why would someone even try to do that? And I said, okay, now what if I do Y to your system? No, 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 no nobody would ever do that, right? So what, what we see here is that when we build system, we kind of um, make system in the hope that people only use it in the way it was intended for, right? But if we basically break that and we start messing with the system, then we get unexpected behavior. And then, uh, let's say, do Z to the system. Oh no, I never thought that anyone would do that to the system. So now we are in a completely undefined state and we don't know what happens to the system. So now I think it's time to look at a few of those examples to actually so that we build the mindset of what I'm talking about here. So if you look here, if you have been to an airport, other than one in Graz, because Graz still uses metal detectors. This is a full body scanner. And this is research that was done by the UC San Diego. And when you look here, it, to, uh, from a first glance, it looks like two identical pictures, right? So what is wrong? What is wrong with one or the other picture? Is someone hiding something? Someone hiding a weapon, a knife, something? So in fact, the hide explosives here. And what's so particularly interesting about this one here is that the problem with the, the explosives is that you don't have a belly button. So what they did for the research study actually is that this is the detonator. So now if someone <laughs> looks at it, wow, you might go through a body scanner and no one would ever detect it, right? So this is complete failure basically. All right. The second example, probably some of you have already heard that, but back in the early days when we started pacemakers, the idea was, okay, we only have to uh, cut the patient open only once and then make the pacemaker remotely accessible so we can do some updates, we adjust the rate of the pacemaker, but no one ever thought about it that we can also attack a pacemaker, right? There are no, or in the beginning probably now because we know of the problem, but in the beginning, there were absolutely no security features for pacemakers and the, an attacker could basically just connect remotely to the pacemaker and adjust the rate. It's perfect killing, right? All right, and the third one, I like this one in particular, and that is granting physical access to system. So now we build systems for the internet, for example, and they might be completely secure, but we forget to actually uh, secure the physical access. So I hope some, or potentially some of you have been on vacation, vacation rental, for example, Airbnb. Quite often you see, oh, there is a router standing around, right? So I could go mess with the router, adjust it, change the firmware, even replace the router and they potentially wouldn't even know it. So uh, for me, 
it's probably not worth doing, but imagine, I don't know, high-end vacation rental for Paris Hilton. Probably worth doing if I get all the information she sends over the router, right? The other thing is uh, medical treatment. So when you go to a doctor's appointment and then they guide you into basically that waiting room where you wait for the doctor. Oh, it's the examination room actually. And you wait for the doctor and then the, the nurse types something on the computer and then she leaves, please wait here for the doctor, right? So the last time I've been to the doctor here in Austria, I said, oh, there are all these names. I could just go there and click and see all the medical history of all the patients. So uh, failure here to think adversarially. And we have to practice that. We have to build a mindset for that. Not only in the digital world, but also uh, in our regular physical world. And then uh, one last example here is voting machines in the United States. Different states have different voting machines, and some of them already banned it. But there are still voting machines in the US where you can go, you vote, you are in that small little cabin, and in the end, it's just a personal computer, right? So potentially, an attacker could mess with that computer and change the results. So again, what went wrong here? It's complete failure to think adversarially. In the first one, for example, um, Body scanners, so one thing is body scanners are really hard to get. So mostly all the companies that sell body scanners, they only sell it to airports, right? So my friends of UC San Diego actually had a really t hard time getting one um, of the body scanners to actually do some research and to come up with that picture I just showed you where they hide explosives. Um, the, the other assumption for the second example with the pacemaker is that, oh yeah, at attackers are not going to mess with that system, right? Not mess with the pacemaker. And the third one, attackers don't mess with the uh, physical access. All right, so what is different to security people? Security people think completely different. The way I think everyone, like even everyone in this room, I like you, I, but I don't trust you. Everything is malicious. The network is malicious, my coworkers are malicious, other machines are malicious. Uh, computers on the internet, computers in the real world internet, every, everything is potentially malicious. And this is how we actually build our mindset, right? <clears throat> Please remember, trust is a bad word. This is the one thing you should go home with, that trust is a bad word. Uh, unfortunately, trust is also not binary, right? So I can trust Bob, but then Bob gets too much access, right? So what we really want is to, to flip the question around. It should not be, do I trust Bob? But what do I trust Bob to do? For example, you have a, I don't know, a shiny new startup, right? And you have a few coworkers. What do you trust your coworkers or your employees potentially? What do you trust them to do? So you trust them actually to commit some code, but do you actually also trust them to build the release, to ship it to thousands, millions of users? What if they do it on a Saturday night where you are drinking and then all of a sudden that person, one of your employees goes nuts because you haven't given him a raise, for example, right? He messes with the system, he updates it, and he just ships a completely malicious software to millions of users, right? Or, or even worse, whom do we trust to have the nuclear uh, launch codes? So what we would try to do is actually create some trust levels. Ideally, we start out with no trust at all, right? In practice, as little trust as possible, so least privilege system, and we get bonus points if actually the ability to verify correct behavior. So this is what banks do a lot, right? Because they are super scared that something that their money disappears. So even though, I mean, assuming they have the best intention to provide the best security, but what they do in addition is they log everything, like literally every little thing that happens in the system. So in case everything goes wrong, they can go back, they look at their logs, and hopefully they find out what went wrong in the end and can make it better in the future. One little story for trust levels here. Two stories, the one kind of funny story. So my dad recently had surgery, right? And they don't give you information on the phone anymore. You have to provide that little password. And 
Then you call, you say, hey, how is my dad doing? And then they ask you for the password. But in my case, my mom actually brought that to the hospital. She created that password, and I didn't know about it. But after the surgery, I called and said, hey, can I get some information from my dad? I said, how do you know the password? Ah, you know what? Ah, sorry, my mom is not here, and I really need to know what happens to my dad. And then I said, oh, OK. All right, so we give you all the information. You see here, they just blindly trusted me, right? There was no verification in that process. And this is actually interesting because uh, quite often what companies do, they have good security guarantees on the internet, but in case you have to reset your password because you have forgotten your password and stuff like that, you can call a certain number, right? And quite often on the phone, oh yeah, we reset the password. We don't know who you are, but potentially you are the person of that account, right? So this is all terrible. The one good story is that is also quite funny. Recently were elections in Austria, and my mom went to go to vote. Small little village, few hundred people. Everyone knows everyone in that little village, right? So my mom goes, to, hey, yeah, I'm here. I want to vote. And I said, can we see your passport? No, I don't have my passport with me. But you know me. We are neighbors. They said, no. No way. No vote without the passport. So my mom called me up. She was super upset. I had to go home and get my password. I said, yes, that's awesome. That's great. They didn't trust you. And that's good in the end, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the United States is a country where you can vote with, without passport. Right. There are many other countries uh, that do the same. We're just so used to, uh, to, to carrying this, this document. Right. And it doesn't have anything to do with trust. Well, there, there is a, a difference to that. First, in the United States, only roughly like 30% of people own a passport, right? So they have different right. mechanisms. But in, in Austria, if you want to go to vote, you have to provide a valid ID. That is either a passport or whatever identification you have, right? And that is the law in Austria. And it's good that they basically go with that. Right? United States is different. For example, in the United States, they're also Amish. They have, don't have any kind of I identification. Was, I, was, I, was, I was going to the point, um, it doesn't have an effect on democracy if you have to, uh, have to pro uh, uh, prove identity uh, at, the, at uh, the polling station or not. Because uh, um, um, in the US, people, uh, uh, people could prove that voter fraud on, on, um, on the level of, of yes. voters is, is, is not existing. Uh, Different story, and I'm happy to discuss that afterwards. Okay. The, the, the regulations we build in Austria, uh, what I'm getting at with that story is that we have some regulations. There is a law, and it's good that we also enforce that law. We don't simply trust anyone, right? And that is the point I'm making here. But I'm happy to discuss more of that later on. <clears throat> All right, so threat modeling. Whenever we do a security review, we basically always, the very first question is, well, what is the threat model of the systems? Who are the attackers and what capabilities do they actually have to attack the system? What are their goals? Who are the attackers? Again, first questions. And now, even though a few of my stories sound funny, it's actually quite hard. To do a real proper security review is really hard work, and it takes years of practice. Uh, but what you do is you build a threat model for the application, right? So you're invited by a company, you build a threat model for the application. You look at that, I'm sorry, and then you look at the systems, and with the threat model in mind, you start examining how the system actually works, right? And there are so many different applications, so it's not one thing fits all, right? It's very... Uh, it, it's important to actually look at the, every single application in detail. That, that's, what I'm, that's the point here. Uh, and then we look at that application through the threat model, and then we start. We generate a list of all the vulnerabilities. We sit down with the developers, and then we go through that. As we will see later on, actually, I provided a little example. It's not enough to simply identify the problems, right? Fixing them is sometimes super expensive, right? And Shareholders potentially have different interests. Okay, security. Mm. Okay, but we make less money. I want the new Porsche in the end, right? Or I want the new house. So, conflict of interest sometimes. All right. I provided 
uh, a little case study that show, will show you. So first, uh, we looked at Firefox. We work uh, on constantly improving the security of Firefox, right? And security mechanisms we put in place years ago are potentially not the right security uh, for the future, right? So we have to adapt. The environment changes, the internet changes, like everything changes. It's not, what, what, what I'm saying is security is not a one-time process. So today we have that evaluation, tomorrow we put in a security and we're done with it. That's not how it works. It's a constant process and things change and we have to adapt to those changes. Um, since I'm here, I thought it's not really technical, but a little technical, but overall what I'm getting at at the end is the cost of putting new security features in. So for example, when Firefox uh, downloads something from the internet, it has to perform numerous security um, checks. Some of them are file access checks. So for example, that a web page cannot access your local files on your computer, right? Would be terrible if they can upload the images from your last vacation to the internet and someone else could look at it. Then probably you all have heard of the same origin policy, which was basically the first security mechanism that was put in place on the internet. And it basically allows, in simple words, it allows JavaScript from the same origin to access each other's objects, but JavaScript originating from different object, uh, from different hosts uh, cannot access each other's objects. There is also cross-origin resource sharing. I don't want to bore you with all the details. Uh, what's interesting, I guess, for our example, is content security policy, and I will get to that in a second. So first, what we looked at, we looked at Firefox and we evaluated, we constantly evaluated, that's what we do every single day basically. Uh, and we looked at how does the internet change, right? And what we found out is by adding some telemetry, and telemetry is a, a way that Firefox can collect information from the users. And we saw that, okay, almost 12% of every single, so basically when you perform a request, download an image, a script, uh, or a style sheet, 12% of all these sub-resource loads get redirected, right? So that means uh, security changes, and we have to adapt to those changes. So I provided <clears throat> a small little example that basically guides you through to better understand what we're looking here. Uh, Probably you have seen that, that the content, a page ships with the content security policy script source good.com. And that basically instructs the browser that script can only be loaded from good.com. So in the first case, before we download something from the internet, Firefox performs a check. Okay, um, is this good.com library JS app allowed to be loaded within Firefox? Okay, in this case, in this case it looks up the CSP script source good.com the load is allowed. So now what happens now? Uh, the server actually responds with a 3.0 whatever redirect and all of a sudden we are back in the browser and we are telling, okay, this resource is not available from that location but downloaded from that other location, right? So what we have to do now is we have to perform another security check to make sure we provide the same uh, security guarantees after a server-side redirect. So now we look uh, a little bit of terminology, so you understand that the next slide, but basically there is the separation between Gecko and Neko in Firefox, and Gecko is basically the rendering, Gecko is basically the rendering engine that really uh, brings content onto your screen, like HTML, GS, uh, JavaScript, CSS, and whatnot. And then Neko is uh, the network library that really connects to the internet and gathers or loads data over the internet. So for legacy reasons, those two were completely developed separately. The idea was that Neko uh, can be shipped as a standalone client and can be used by other projects. In the end, that never happened, and now those uh, separation between Gecko and Neko actually vanishes. But what, so back in the days when this was the case, because I mentioned legacy code, the idea was, okay, we have Gecko performs a resource load. Let's say loads JavaScript, right? So we perform security checks in Gecko because Neko was completely agnostic to any kind of load information. It didn't even know what it was loading, right? And to say, in addition, that was all opt-in code. So all, before you load something from the internet as a Firefox developer, you have to put the right security uh, 
uh, checks in place, and then after that you can perform the load. So we security-minded people already see that this is suboptimal, right? Because now Firefox has roughly, let's say, 500 developers, and I cannot check for every single person all the time that put the right security checks in place. So the idea was, what we need to do is flip it around completely and have perform security checks by default, right? Uh, I can assure you the good thing is that Mozilla has a bunch of very smart developers, some of the smartest I've ever met, and we haven't encountered uh, a single place where to date uh, security checks were missing. So that is the good news. But either way, it's better to have opt-out security mechanisms versus opt-in security mechanisms. So this was the old world. We perform the security check in Gecko. We call into Neko, say, hey, Neko, please load us that information from the internet. And then we hit the server-side redirect. So now it becomes complicated, right? <laughs> because all of a sudden, we have to call back from the Neko layer who didn't know anything about what we were loading, whether it was a script, image, style sheets, whatnot. We had to call back into Gecko. So now what do you do? You don't have any information available how to perform the security check. Obviously suboptimal. So what we do, slowly uh, we added more and more information to channels. A channel rep represents how data is loaded within Firefox. And we made it available, but obviously in a kind of hackish way. So we flipped that thing completely around and now Gecko provides some load information. That load information is attached to the channel. We give that to Neko, which is now possible because Gecko and Neko is not separated anymore. Um, and whenever we perform a, a server-side redirect, we still have the same information available. We can perform the same security checks. It's awesome. All right, a little bit, two more, two more slides about technical stuff and then we go back to our adversarial thinking. Uh, what we do here is, uh, we attach that new object and that holds a loading principle, a content policy type, and security flex. That's in a nutshell, right? The loading principle represents the security context. So actually, the next slide shows that real nice. Um, the loading principle shows the security context. Uh, in our example, good.com, we have the content policy type, which is TypeScript, that tells us we're loading a script. Uh, and in that particular case, we allow cross-origin loads. All right, so now wake up again. This is important. We are back from all the technical stuff from Firefox. What is the cost? So we identified it, which is great, but now we also have to fix it, right? So Firefox puts the user first. They don't care about going the extra mile. They really have a very strong opinion about security. And they don't care how much it costs. They put it in for the users. So we had to update it roughly 100 plus um, network loads. That's how many different kinds of loads happen within Firefox. Obviously, they have, we have a massive testing infrastructure, so we had to update more than 400 tests. And one engineer um, worked full time for 20 months and dozens of reviewers. Um, yeah, what, what's the cost? We landed 500, almost 520 change sets. 130,000 lines of code, so one can already see that that is expensive, and we roughly invested 3,500 man hours, right? So if your CEO or the executive have different interests than security, then obviously this is not something uh, that they wanna invest. So what can every developer do to actually build a, a little bit of security or make it a little better? Well, as I already said, ultimately it's the decision of the executives because we as a little developer, we, we, we cannot do much, right? It has to come from the higher ups. They have to know that it is important that we build security into our systems and that it's worth the effort. And one thing worth mentioning here is we have seen so many companies, they basically, I mean, in the beginning you have a startup, you wanna push out a feature, right? I understand that, I totally get it. But after you have critical mass of users and then you don't provide the security, you are gone way faster than you appeared. Um, what every developer can do, in my opinion, is first, <coughs> attend this talk. Keep security in mind when you write your code. Think adversarially what can, what can happen to API when someone throws random input at it or tries to abuse the system. Don't trust anyone to only interact with the system you're designing in the way you designed it for because people will start messing with it. 
And what we have seen, this is very important, having a strong review culture is very important. You can shake out so many bugs and problems by having someone review your code. Uh, one last little thing that I usually do is fuzzing. I mean, obviously, fuzzing can be done on a very big level, but also a very small level. So now your boss says, hey, can you implement that small little class with that API for me? Yeah, sure, can do that. Uh, what you can do is fuzz that API. And fuzzing, has anyone heard of fuzzing? Everyone familiar with fuzzing? Fuzzing is really have some, let's say, a Python script or whatever, and really throw random input at that API and see what the system responds. If it crashes, suboptimal, right? If it returns some results that you are not intended to leak, no good. And there are two different types. The one is a generational fuzzer, uh, which really generates new input. And the other one, which is equally important, is mutational fuzzer. Mutational fuzzer is, take some input that you are actually uh, a real world input that you expect and then just tweak it a little bit, right? Change, for, for example, if you, your function accepts a string, just change a few characters, expand it, shrink it, some other decode, uh, yeah, some, use some other decoding before you throw it. All right, it's time to practice thinking adversarially and I provided a small little example and I hope you all want to help me enumerate all the vulnerabilities in that small little application. And it's something that we do every day, right? A web survey. Everyone takes web service. The, the Silicon Valley loves web service. Like every single company does web service because they constantly want to improve uh, how they operate. They want to get better. They want to get faster. So they evaluate every little detail. So this is actually a real world example um, and this is also the architecture of how most web services work. So basically, you have some executives of a company, and they say, okay, so this is one of what we want to evaluate, right? We want to evaluate uh, A, B, and C. So we give it to a surveyor. They send out links to every single user, which is like, let's say, every employee. And then they basically link that link in their email, and it's all anonymous, obviously, right? Then they send it to the web server, they collect the results, and they report it back to the executives. All right, who wants to be the first one who call out one of the problems with this system? Yes, user identification is definitely a problem. This is also very interesting because uh, user identification, what happens, geographic location, right? What if you only have one user in Austria, one user in Graz? Whatever that person reports, right, we would know because it's only one user, right? So that's interesting. But then how can you mess with that system without any cryptography, right? Obviously, we can have man-in-the-middle attacks and everything on top of all of that. Yes, please. Just change the links or you get. Um Yes. See if you get another survey. Yes, that actually happening. So this is not something that I come up with. That all happens in the wild, right? Particularly interesting, one second. Particularly interesting is here, uh, you usually get an email, let's say at 11 a.m., you're in the middle of hacking something super awesome, right? So ah, I'll do that later. So what happens, you get, after 24 hours or whatever, you get another email. Hey, have, it seems you haven't done the survey yet. It's time to do it. But do we actually always verify that this is the same link? Does it look the same? Maybe this, the surveyor changed the link, so now I'm evaluating something completely else? Yes, please. As a director, I could write a script to impersonate many of these users and many of the results. Yeah, that you can do. One thing that I like in particular is, I mean, on every single node here, we have potential problems, right? So let's start with the survey, surveyor, right? So we want to evaluate A and B, but the surveyor in the end does, yeah, but actually I kind of want to make some money on the side. Have you heard of Glassdoor? Glassdoor basically provides information of how much money you make as a developer at every single company. So what if I just sneak in an additional question, right? How much money do you make? So the answer, I make $100,000 a month, a year, awesome that goes around to the web server. The surveyor takes the information out, 
sells it to Glassdoor or for whatever other web platform there is, and then they only report all the other questions back, right? So that is actually something that also happened in the wild. I'm not saying it's Glassdoor, it was just a random example, but that happened. Um, the next one is the user. So what can I do as a user? We are in a company and I hate Paul. I hate Paul so much. He got promoted recently and I didn't. In fact, I'm the way better programmer. So what can I do in the survey? Can I write stuff like, hey, basically, I'm Paul, right? This is just a text box, but I could reveal some information so that the executive thinks that I'm Paul and I hate the executives, right? So impersonation, basically. Uh, then we do, uh, the information gets sent back to the web server. The web server can be compromised, right? Obviously. Uh, we get the results back to the surveyor. The surveyor takes all, out all the information that they don't, don't want to provide back to the executives. And then last time I gave that talk, someone actually said something interesting. I mean, we have thought about it before, but it's awesome. What can the executives do? They can also lie about everything, right? They say, oh yeah, we have done that survey, and in fact, we don't do any PTO, no vacation anymore for anyone. All the employees said, we don't want vacation. We want to work 24 seven all the time, right? So, small little example, and we can already see that it's super hard. It's super hard to actually make that better. We tried, we sat down several security engineers for two days. We basically locked ourselves up, and it's hard. It's really hard, we came up, with a system that is completely unusable. <laughs> it's secure, but completely unusable, which is also not the solution, right? But what we really can do is we can try to eliminate the low-hanging fruit, right? Raise the bar for security. <clears throat> and with that, I want all of you to remember before you go home that trust is a bad word. And remember to think adversarially. I hope that talk slightly changed your mind towards a more tech-oriented view of a system. And with that, I want to conclude my talk. I will be here all afternoon. I'm happy to chat with every single one of you if you're interested. Have a coffee or a beverage of your choice and just talk about random things. And if you have any questions right now, I'm happy to answer. We have a few more minutes. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we ship it by default yet. I think it's, it's in one of the channels. So Firefox has several channels before we go live, right? So there's Aurora channel and the beta channel. Each has six weeks of baking time where we have beta users. Uh, I, I think I, I can check after the talk in what state it is. But yeah, we are definitely going to ship that soon. No more question. I'm the only one standing between you and lunch, I know that, so. <laughs> Go have lunch, we can find me later on for some chats, some talks. Enjoy the rest of the day.